We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I'm the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am very excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Michelle Wood. She is the Vice President of People and Culture at Bellbridge Property Advisors. Michelle, thank you for being here. If you want to share a little bit for our listeners about yourself, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly to answer the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Thanks, Christina. I'm really excited to be here today with you and um, your listeners. Um, I am Michelle Wood. I am Vice President of People and Culture at Valbridge Property Advisors. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, I, when I wanted to, what I wanted to be when I grew up, I was an astronaut, which <laughs> was, uh, you know, I grew up in the era of the space shuttle and um, it was, it was kind of exciting to watch um, that as a child. And unfortunately I was terrible at math and science. So um, that was really not my, <laughs> my career path long-term, but that's, uh, I definitely had nights where I dreamed of, uh, of being an astronaut. I love that uh, answer. Fast forward to today, even though you are not an astronaut, uh, I would love to know kind of how your personal journey has really led you into the people and culture space um, and specifically at Valbridge Property Advisors as well. Yeah, sure. Well, Valbridge Property Advisors, for those who haven't heard of us, is a commercial real estate appraisal company, and it's um, we have 80 offices nationwide. So the profession that I work in is um, commercial real estate appraisal, but um, like most people, I did not start out there. Uh, professionally, I um, kind of got here by accident. I um, thought I would work in nonprofit after college. I did a year of AmeriCorps working with homeless families in Trenton, and that was really rewarding work for me. But I started to get the academic itch again, um, coming out of that program and um, went to pursue a master's degree in American Indian studies in Tucson, Arizona. So my fiance and I at the time uh, went to Tucson and um, I did my master's degree in American Indian studies thinking I would do curriculum design, but um, realized I would need to get a PhD to do that. And that wasn't really a good fit for me. So I worked in nonprofit for a couple of, of years. I ran a mentoring program for at-risk youth there in Tucson through the university. Um, but I wasn't making enough money to cover childcare expenses when my daughter was born. So I stayed home with her for about a year and then decided I was ready to work again and um, started working with my husband uh, in commercial real estate appraisal, thinking I would be an appraiser. But um, turns out I was not particularly good at it and I did not enjoy it. So <laughs> that that didn't feel like a good fit. And I realized I wouldn't be, uh, I would never be good at it if I didn't love it. So that started me sort of on the path of creating my own job description there within that Valbridge firm um, in Arizona. And I really went in a direction that felt more like a fit to me, which was working more directly with um, our colleagues, you know, doing research and networking, doing some business development type of relationship building, that sort of stuff. And then when we eventually moved to Houston, to the Valbridge firm here in Houston, um, I was lucky that the firm here allowed me to kind of continue along that line of, of finding a good fit for myself and finding ways to add value within my own skill set and my own interests. So continued doing some research and networking and then also started writing content for the, the company nationwide and um, then started working in program development a little bit and um, developed our internship program and um, now I'm in this current role of um, vice president of people and culture, where I do a lot of executive coaching and um, team building exercises and thinking through ways in which to professionally enhance the experience of our appraisers and the support staff within the company. So it's uh, it's been a long journey of inventing my own roles, but I think that that's been a good fit for me. And I'm lucky to be somewhere that they've um, allowed me the space to do that. 
Absolutely. I think that is awesome that you've been able to invent and really design and, and continue to redesign, add value to the organizations uh, that you've been a part of as well and uh, kind of the industry too. I think when we talk about relationship building and feeling empowered to do your best work, I want to kind of jump into the discussion around company culture. It's in the title of our interview series. Um, and I want to ask specifically around affinity groups or employee resource groups uh, in terms of what role they, they play um, at Valbridge and what role they also do not play in defining that as well. Yeah, that's this is such an exciting thing to talk about, I think, um, in this time. So in general, affinity groups, I think, are a relatively new phenomenon within company culture and I, within our industry specifically. I think like this is something that the larger companies are starting to put together. Commercial real estate appraisal is traditionally a very male-dominated field, and um, our racial diversity is not particularly strong historically either. So the need uh, for affinity groups, I think, is especially prominent in this industry. Um, one, one way that we've started to meet that need within Valbridge is a few years ago, we formed the Valbridge Women's Council and uh, I'm privileged to serve as the president of that organization now for the last 18 months, coming to the end of my tenure there. Um, and that was formed really to support the needs of the women within the company, but we've we've been able to expand it to really serve the needs of all of the people, I think, of the company in different ways. Within the council, about a year ago, we established a Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, DEI for short. And that's that was launched. Um, we've seen strong interest from people across the company to join that committee and really participate to create initiatives that um, can help in particular with recruiting, you know, we have um, we have a need to diversify our our industry. And so thinking through ways to um, to reach out to traditionally underrepresented groups and bring them into our company and make sure that they're feeling supported and getting the kind of training that they need. Um, and also we're doing in the council, um, well, the, the Women's Council is something I'm, I'm particularly proud of in general, not just from a diversity standpoint, but also thinking through ways in which we can create um, an incubation space for future leaders of the company. And so we create and run programs um, nationwide for the company. We host webinars and instructional workshops um, using both in-house experts and outside speakers. Um, and we give back in the form of fundraising campaigns several times a year. Um, some of our member firms are small and there may be only one woman in the office. So this is a way for them to be able to connect and share experiences, share concerns, um, share best practices, form connection, partnership, and get true professional leadership experience in a supportive network of shared values. So as our company grows, I can see using the template of what we've developed in the Women's Council to create more affinity groups based on whatever needs might be most prominent at the time. And I'm that's something I'm really proud of um, that we've been able to put together and, and develop it in a way that makes the most sense for us as, um, as women within the, the company. Absolutely. And an opportunity to meet people across different departments, potential mentors, sponsors, and you know, colleagues as well to form that connection. We know that there are so many studies that show when you feel connected to your team and the work, the the output is better, your kind of happiness level is is uh, better as well within the, the organization. So it's a win-win for, for really everyone. Um, I want to ask directly as well, how do you see kind of this um, kind of thread of employee well-being and really employee inclusivity and of course performance really interrelated with one another? Yeah, I think those connections are really strong and are interrelated, as you said. Um, one of the wonderful things we're seeing now is an abundance of research and data that um, supports the idea that employee well-being and performance are directly linked. And um, 
I don't think that that really comes as a surprise to us as humans when we think about how do we perform best or what <laughs> in what environments do we perform best? And of course, it's it's always when we're most engaged and when we're feeling most supported. So I think um, the fact that company culture is starting to catch up to that idea is really exciting. Um, thinking about ways to create those environments goes right to the bottom line in terms of productivity and innovation. So your more engaged and enthusiastic employees are going to be your high performers, and that's going to really um, give you an advantage from a business standpoint. But that's the hard part, right? Creating an environment that always is supporting and sustaining that level of engagement and commitment. Um, so it really takes a top-down um, intentionality, I think, from the leaders in a company to uh, to make that a priority and then model it and um, give people the space, especially in lower levels of leadership, give them that space to, to support that and, um, and explore ways in which to make that happen in a way that makes the most sense for their organization. So we're seeing more and more companies um, like mine create these roles. You know, the <laughs> business leaders have a lot of responsibilities. Um, there's a long list of things for them to do and think about in a day. So it's not always possible or feasible for them to be thinking through this stuff um, in particular. And there's not a lot of specific types of training that you can just kind of go through quickly and now you know how to create a holistic environment or you can <laughs> create a supportive, engaging environment. So it's been nice to see um, some, some thought leader companies um, create roles like this that, um, you know, my job is to really think through those ideas and to make sure I'm, I'm researching that and um, getting the most up-to-date information and translating that to the specific environment that we work in, the profession that I work in and understanding, you know, what does a real estate appraiser do? What does their day look like? What are the pressures that are on them? And what is their professional trajectory? How can I bring in these new ideas of engagement and well-being and performance enhancement in a way that makes sense for them and what their job description is? And then, of course, all of our support staff as well. And um, I think that having someone in-house like that can really be an advantage because unlike outside consultants, sometimes, um, you know, they don't understand the day to day. But I think that the, the creation of these types of roles in the business environment is really a, a positive step forward for thinking through well-being and performance for workers. Absolutely. There is a or really an abundance of data around this. And to your point as well, really creating an environment where folks feel like they have the resources, tools, and leadership support um, is also important to this, this well-being. I think over the last few years with the pandemic and just the changing role of the workplace in general, folks have really defined what kind of that engagement looks like as well and retention. From your perspective, what does a holistic strategy for employee engagement look like uh, for your team and at Valbridge at large? Yeah, I love I love that word holistic, Christina. So I'm I'm happy to hear that word in this talk. Um, so you know, kind of thinking through this this interview um, earlier, I looked up the word holistic, and uh, it it literally means characterized by comprehension of the parts of something as intimately interconnected and explicable by right, reference to the whole. And I like thinking about that idea. And we think about like the whole person in the field of medicine, we hear that, you know, holistic medicine kind of idea. And in business, I think you think about it in terms of whole systems, you know, not just siloed little parts of how we do um, any particular kind of business. So we know now, and they're discovering more every day about how like small things are interconnected and can have impacts, um, both negatively and positively on larger systems. So thinking about ways um, of taking a more holistic approach takes a retraining of the mind um, for a lot of us, and it has to be modeled by leadership. Um, 
So one of the ways that I try to practice and model this for myself and the people that are under my care is that I try to take a dedicated 10 or 15 minutes before every meeting. And whether that's a, a one-on-one -on -one meeting or um, a larger meeting where I'm hosting presenters or um or even if it's just a phone call, you know, I try to take a dedicated 10 or 15 minutes to really think about who is going to be there with me and what do I know about that person or about this group of people? Um, what might be going on with them, you know, and what are they there to take out of our time together? So, Thinking through all of that and as much as I as I'm able to understand about those people and um, the time and then really try to use that information to think about how I'm coming into that space. What is my tone of voice? What is my body language? What are the words that I'm using? How do I make that time efficient, but also really meaningful for those people? Um, I think that's that's one way in which I'm trying to think about the experience in a more holistic way. Um, active listening is a skill that I think is really undervalued in professional circles. And if it's practiced well, it can be such a game changer though in making meetings and relationships, um, really communication of all kinds, very effective and efficient. Um, when we're young and we're just coming into the workplace, you know, you, you're eager and you want to impress your boss, you want to impress your coworkers. And, you know, we're always anxious to kind of like show what we know and we're talking a lot and we're not really listening, I think in a lot of ways. Um, so learning to practice that and then put it, put it into use is I think just a skill that will <laughs> reap benefits no matter what part of your career you're in. Um, I think holistic environments also really create a sense of curiosity, humility, and a love of learning. And that's important. So you don't get stuck in um, feedback loops. Um, you don't succumb to groupthink or the pressure to just conform or fit in to an environment, which of course is what stifles innovation. So you know, remembering that humans are really creative and um, they bring such a spectrum of unique experience um, and, and perspectives. So an environment where they can safely bring those ideas and those perspectives is really going to underpin um, innovation and environments that um, people feel supported in a holistic way. Um, within our company, because of our franchise structure, this can look a lot of different ways and move at different paces. Um, but if one model, if one office models it, then it makes it smoother for other offices to use it as well. So they can understand and adopt it and maybe um, shift it to their needs or their environment specifically. Innovation is certainly one of our core values as a company. So this is another way to think about innovation and how to cultivate it. Yeah, I think innovation is critical to that piece as well. And when you demonstrate that you are actively listening, you're creating that environment, um, and also as leaders really modeling that behavior, uh, then that's really important for folks to feel like they can come forward with new ideas, give feedback, positive, negative, anything in between as well. Um, I also want to ask too, in terms of how you have seen the role of leaders, especially those people managers who are motivating a team really evolve um, over time in terms of, you know, what they are kind of expected to, where the resources they are able to, to provide. What have you seen over the last few years? Um, well, I've been really lucky and interested in this, in this very idea. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in the last two years thinking hard about leadership and, um, learning as much as I can about leadership. And I've been very lucky to have a lot of amazing leaders in my life who served as role models um, and coaches for me that I've been able to learn from. So the idea of leadership now is one that really resonates with me. Um, the, the idea of a servant leader is, is something that I think um, makes the most sense to me and I think makes the most sense for this time. Um, I've seen this modeled really effectively in the in the people that I most admire. Um, 
one quotation that I heard a year ago that really stuck with me was leadership is how people experience themselves in your presence. I love this idea because you can watch um, how great leaders enhance and elevate the people in their care. And you can also see the opposite happen when that's not done well. Um, so I think remembering that um, has been a really informative way for me to think about leadership. The very best leaders that I see are very intentional in how they care for people, how they carve out time to be thoughtful in regular intervals, whether that's daily or weekly, um, but they, they definitely make that time to think through how to care for people. Um, and they take time to really understand the people that are under their care and um, respond to them in ways that are, are needed and appropriate. The idea of a manager just coming in, giving directives and watching over your shoulder because they don't trust you, I think is really outdated. And um, it's nice to see people sort of um, turning away from that nowadays. Managers now need to think of themselves as coaches more, I think, um, creating vision and unity, um, really knowing each team member's strengths and the areas of improvement, keeping a pulse on progress of both the individuals and the dynamics within the team itself. Um, this is not easy, you know, <laughs> it's certainly not easy to do well, but I think there's places you can see it modeled really beautifully. Um, for me, watching the TV show Ted Lasso has been like a really great sort of crash course in seeing this modeled um, well. And of course, that character is, is a sports coach, but I, if you watch that show, you'll see a lot of lessons that can be translated well into the business environment um, too. Absolutely. I love having kind of those examples that you can reference as well, whether it's Ted Lasso, another kind of person within the organization as well, who's really manifesting those uh, kind of goals and an example of that servant leadership is, is really great to point to as well. Um, I know that we are nearing our the end of our time together, but I do want to ask if there are any things that you want to highlight in terms of people, talent, and culture changes that were made back in 2020, and what are some of the results of, of those changes? Yeah, uh, as awful and as traumatic as the pandemic was for so many people, um, we've definitely seen some positive change come out of it. And sometimes it takes that level of collapse for <laughs> new ideas and new trends to take root. Um, and so I think one really positive change is that people are thinking through what they will and they won't tolerate in the workplace. And they're feeling more empowered to give voice to those needs and those ideas on improvement. Companies that are responsive to that will be the ones that thrive in the coming decade. And I think we have and will continue to see companies that are not responsive really struggle to attack, attract and retain talent. Um, we're more mobile than ever generationally. And I think professionally, the younger generations don't expect to stay in the same company necessarily for long stretches of time. So retention has to be a top priority for professional organizations. Um, transparency, inclusivity, path of growth, shared values, these are all important to people more than ever. So companies really do need to pay attention to that and make sure that those ideas and those um, realities are front and center for all the people in the organization. Absolutely. Shared values is something that folks are definitely looking for in addition to that company culture, leaders, managers, um, who are, really help them grow and professionally develop too. Um, Michelle, is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to share with folks who are listening or underscore any key takeaways about what we've discussed this afternoon? Um, I think we covered quite a bit here. I, I think um, just the idea of embracing change and how uncomfortable that can be is, is really important um, for both organizations and individuals within organizations. And, uh, you know, one of my leadership coaches is um, his phrase is 
be comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> and I think that's where growth happens. And um, if we can kind of just um, embrace that, then we're on a good trajectory to grow and to learn, to innovate, and to make sure that we're all being aware of each other's well being and um, moving forward in a, in a way that works for everybody. Absolutely. Moving forward together, nobody is in this uh, journey alone uh, and continuing to learn and have that growth mindset. Michelle, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. Thank you so much, Christina. I really enjoyed my time together. Of course. And as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in employees and employers being seen, heard, and understood. I know it's a requirement for the business to really succeed overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. 